to introduce Boris, Boris Heifetz um, has had a, long, a lifelong interest in how consciousness-altering drugs affect fundamental neural processes. He received his MD and PhD degrees in neuroscience from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York and came to Stanford University for residency training in anesthesiology. Since 2013, he has subspecialized in neuroanesthesiology and joined the Stanford School of Medicine faculty. His laboratory research under the guidance of Dr. Robert Malenka, an internationally recognized expert in the synaptic basis of learning, memory, and addiction, focuses on the neural circuits underlying MDMA's pro-social effects in mice. Dr. Heifetz. All right. Thanks, Neil. And thank you all for, uh, for coming today. I want to say at the outset that uh, I'm very honored to share a stage with Drs. Nichol, Volenweider, uh, Danforth, Grobe. These are people that I read as a college student almost 20 years ago and inspired me to come into this field. So 15 years of training later, I'm still managed to, you know, fi managed to find an outlet for that interest. And uh, again, I'm very excited to be here today. So. As you can see, my title is Toward Single Shot Therapy for Neuropsychiatric Disorders. And uh, there's the word toward in there because this is more of a concept than a real full-blown reality in modern medicine. And what I hope to answer uh, in this brief talk is really two questions. And the first is, do we have a convincing roadmap to take what we know about MDMA and ketamine's use clinically and develop something that has broader applicability to the treatment of neuropsychiatric disorder? Uh, the second question is one that I've gotten a lot from the NIH, which is why are you studying neuropsychiatric disorders if you're an anesthesiologist? And I'd like to address that second question uh, first. And for that, I want you to kind of change your perspective a little bit and think about uh, the fact that, you know, we're increasingly recognizing that post-traumatic stress disorder, major depressive disorder, treatment refractory OCD carry as much morbidity and mortality as cardiovascular disease. Now, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, we are willing to match the severity of illness with the intensity of our intervention. That starts with beta blockers and goes through stents, coronary artery bypass grafts, ventricular assist devices, all the way to total artificial heart transplants, which we're doing at Stanford, which is, you know, that's, that's really a full stack of, of therapy. When it comes to uh, most psychiatric disorders, we start with SSRIs and maybe ECT if that doesn't work. So there's, we're really, we're, we're about, I'd say, several decades behind the rest of medicine in that regard. And what I'm hoping to convince you of is that we can take an approach where we give acute therapy, acute, powerful, consciousness-altering therapy in a highly monitored context, and in that way, induce long-term durable treatment effects in patients with psychiatric disease. This is much more of a surgical model. And I don't want to suggest that we can cure psychiatric disease with, you know, in uh, 30 minutes in the operating room. But what I am saying is that we can catalyze trans transformations in people's uh, psyches with these powerful short interventions. And that's really what MDMA and ketamine has, has shown us. And that's what I hope to give you a little roadmap through today. So before I uh, go any further, I want to acknowledge a few people. The first is uh, my department and chair, who for the last seven years have been willing to have an anesthesiology resident studying psychedelic medicine in their department at 75% of my time, which is a uh, remarkable investment and vision. And um, also, apropos of some of the remarks earlier, uh, I, as of last week now, we have NIMH funding uh, through a, a K08 uh, award for MDMA uh, mechanisms for pro-social behavior. So this is really, uh, I think, further evidence that there is a broad-based shift in how the broader medical community views psychiatric disease and our willingness to tackle these hard problems. I've also been supported by anesthesia, um, an anesthesia award, and most important, uh, my mentor, Rob Malenka, um, and the postdocs in his lab, th this work is largely with their help, uh, and through collaborations with Carl Dysroth, also at Stanford, and Bruce McIver. So, without further ado, 
Uh, this is the broad outline of what I want to tell you about. First is, uh, you know, I presented this term single shot therapeutics. So I want to give you a little bit more of a uh, systematic definition of what we're talking about, how MDMA ketamine fit into that category. The second is I want to give you just a brief overview of some of the mechanistic work we've done in animal models to get at what exactly is the neural uh, circuit and synaptic mechanism for MDMA's prosocial effect. Uh, finally, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, deep brain stimulation. Uh, now, you may wonder what the second uh, topic has to do with the third, and this is uh, what I was getting at in the, in the beginning, is that the MDMA is a perfect example of something where a single dose in the context of therapy has years-long effect. Deep brain stimulation, by all rights, should, uh, you know, it's, you have an electrode in the brain, you should be able to induce long-lasting effects in neural circuits and behavior. So one of the enduring questions that's faced uh, interventions for psychiatric disorders like deep brain stimulation is why is it that when you put in an electrode, you need to install a battery pack and leave it on for years? It doesn't really make much sense. So what, what the structure of our research basically is, taking the lessons that we can learn from drugs like MDMA and how they induce these long-lasting effects and applying them to questions uh, like deep brain stimulation and you know disorders like major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, even Parkinson's disease, where we would want to induce the same type of long-lasting changes. And th this would have an enormous impact uh, on patients' quality of life and you know, return trips to the operating room, all, all kinds of metrics that you can imagine. So the first thing, uh, as I promised, I would tell you a little bit more about single shot therapeutics. Obviously, uh, it's a single shot. That's what I'm. Uh, that, that's a, a little bit of a simplification. But the point is that the, the therapeutic mechanism, whatever it is, has very well defined time window. And to illustrate that, I want to start with uh, a, a little bit about ketamine. So as you're probably aware, uh, standard psychiatric uh, treatment for major depressive disorder. Uh, involves SSRIs. And typically, the, uh, the idea is you start with, uh, you know, you start giving a dose of SSRI, then you continue giving the SSRI for months, years, a whole lifetime. You can't really, uh, once you come off of the SSRIs, in many cases, you basically resume whatever those underlying uh, psychiatric symptoms were. Um, in contrast, uh, work from uh, psychiatrists like uh, John Crystal at Yale, uh, this is, over the last 15 years, has been an increasing uh, acknowledgement that ketamine has this powerful antidepressant effect. And what I wa really want to draw your attention to is that it, this, the single uh, doseness of it, so to speak, is that, so that here is a, this, this is a, a figure from one of their studies where this is basically a, a depression severity scale uh, on the y-axis. And what you see here is a single ketamine infusion and then followed out to a week. And it's compared to basically an active placebo, which is midazolam, a benzodiazepine. And what you can see here is that out even at day seven, you still have an antidepressant effect, even though your blood level of ketamine is zero. So that is very different from SSRIs or basically any other therapy we use in, in modern psychiatry. So this gives us a sense that, well, it may be possible somehow to catalyze a long-lasting change. And it turns out that ketamine is not the only such drug. And this is, again, just to summarize, um, you know, what is it we're looking for? A single dose, rapid onset with a durable effect. So ketamine actually may belong to a broader class. And usually uh, people talk about a class of drugs as sharing a pharmacological mechanism. And what I want to argue is that we're, in some, to some extent, moving past receptor mechanisms of psychiatric disease, and we should be moving more towards System, systemic effects on the level of circuits and, and synapses. So looking more at what kind of functional change we're targeting at, at that level of, of analysis. So a couple of interesting things, at least in the anesthesia literature, and this is something that I'm very uh, excited to show my anesthesiologist colleagues, is that like ketamine, nitrous oxide, and isoflurane, two very commonly used anesthetics can actually have a somewhat similar effect. Now, these are small studies, um, but this gives an indication that ketamine is not unique, that there may be more out there where powerful 
mind-altering substances can have long-lasting effects. Now, many of you probably already knew that without me uh, telling you, but this is now in a medical context um, with sy systematic uh, systematic study. So this is an example. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. All right. That was a little too, too much uh, enthusiasm. So uh, this is a study from Peter Nagla looking at nitrous oxide given in major depressive disorder and looking out at 24 hours and seeing a difference in their, uh, their, basically their depression score. So again, indicative of something where at a blood level of zero, you still have a therapeutic effect. And this is a similar study where they're actually comparing, and these two, uh, the blue and the black, they're comparing isoflurane to uh, electro, electroshock convulsive therapy and showing that you actually seem to get even, uh, that, that with isoflurane, you get a sustained remission um, over a relatively short time period, but you still get a sustained remission of these depressive symptoms. So again, this is, these, are, these are indications that there are many drugs out there that we haven't really thought about that may have this kind of effect. And now the one that has, I think, the most, uh, the most promise among these and some of the best clinical evidence is MDMA. And this is uh, largely you know, due to the work of MAPS and Michael Mithoffer, um, these are two studies, you've probably seen these figures before, but the things I really want to draw attention to is that the, the idea that a single MDMA dose, now in their studies they used in some cases two doses, but the point is the same. You have a single dose, at which point you have a, a, a clinical intervention, and then you have this incredibly long-lasting effect. So in the first study uh, was followed out to uh, two months, and the follow-up study in 2013 showed at, the, again, this is a severity of PTSD symptom scale, that you have an incredible, uh, incredible reduction in symptoms that last up to four years out of treatment. So again, there are people, uh, you know, when I present uh, this work uh, from Dr. Mithofer, people have said, well, this, you know, these are small studies. And what I say to them is that there is even a small study, there's nothing paralleling this in the psychiatric literature. You simply don't see effects of this size, even in small studies, for other interventions. And this is, of course, building on years of anecdotal work and uh, work that had been done before MDMA was uh, scheduled. So that gets uh, us to, that, that's really the first point, is that you have a well-defined window during which you have uh, your therapeutic effect. The second point is, you know, how can we benefit from that? Well, if you know when it happens, then we can start studying mechanism in the kinds of models that are really prevalent in modern neuroscience. And this is, a, this is basically a truism in modern neuroscience that if you have a change in behavior that's long lasting, there have to be associated changes at the level of synapses and circuits. So a single stimulus with a rapid onset that has a durable effect. Now, I understand you probably are not synaptic biologists, but to, it, w to those, those folks that, that have some background in uh, basic neuroscience, this is, this is the, the basic finding upon which four decades of work has been uh, based, and that's LTP and LTD. These are the canonical changes that we think can explain changes in behavior. And this is, these are changes in, the, in synaptic strength within well-defined neural circuits. So what you see here, this is a classic paper from Eric Kandel, which led to Nobel Prize and Masao Ito in the 80s. Two different organisms. This is a, a sea snail on the left and a, a rat on the right. And what you see here is the size of, your, of a, a synaptic potential. A brief intervention, which is a titanic burst of activity, followed by this sustained change in the size of that potential, and that relates to a behavior in the sea snail. Likewise, you see something similar happening in, in rat, and this is in the cerebellum. So the point is that th these, two, um, th these two phenomena of long-term uh, potentiation of depression are what we associate with changes in behavior. Now, the trick is, how do you actually figure out where those changes are happening? And once we understand that, then maybe we can begin to build upon uh, the therapies that we've, we've been studying. So there is a question uh, that I often get here as well. You know, a lot of people take MDMA and ketamine, but we don't really see, <laughs> not everybody seems to get a, a benefit. And, you know, it, they take it in all kinds of contexts. And this is a basic epidemiology question, is you have, for example, in the operating room, there are probably 100 million anesthetics every year. Ketamine has been used for many, many years. 
Uh, and yet anesthesiologists seem to have missed this effect. So how did that happen? Uh, and with MDMA, you have, uh, at least according to the CDC estimates, a million new recreational users each year. So, and this really leads to two questions is, for example, you know, what were we just not looking at all at our patients? Uh, and in the case of MDMA is where are all the cases of people that go to raves and have spontaneously remitting psychiatric diseases? And the point is that these, uh, the, it's, it's not that we haven't looked, these things just don't seem to happen. And that's because these uh, therapies require a context. And this is something we know uh, in the realm of synaptic uh, plasticity, and this is becoming increasingly evident at the level of therapy. And again, so this is, uh, this is actually a, a screen cap of Dr. Midhofer uh, from the, I think, the MAPS website. Um, but you can see that the basic um, equation that I'm, uh, or in parallel that I'm trying to draw is that MDMA in the context of ongoing therapy can yield these incredible long-lasting results. And when we think about how we can translate this to other types of therapy, for example, uh, deep brain stimulation, which I'll talk about a little bit, it's the same kind of idea. And this echoes, again, the basic work on long-term potentiation and depression, that cellular drug action plus neural activity of some kind, be it therapy, be it direct stimulation of neurons, can have an effect at the level of behavior and at the level of circuits. So our job is to figure out, well, what is that actual transformation? Where is that happening? And it turns out that, you know, this is, uh, there are a lot of possible <laughs> candidates. There is, this is just a sampling of uh, brain areas and synapses where long-term plasticity has been found to occur. And I chose these because they specifically highlight that coincidence that I brought up before, where you have uh, metabotropic or, uh, you know, drug action at specific receptors, well, serotonin receptors, metabotropic glutamate receptors, combined with neural stimulation produce long-term changes in activity. So we know this is a widespread uh, phenomenon. So, and, and that again brings us to this idea that not only does MDMA require a context of psychotherapy, but in the operating room, deep brain stimulation, for example, may require some other uh, drug in order to really uh, get the therapeutic effect we're looking for. So again, this basic, you know, very simplified equation of cellular drug action plus neural activity yielding long-term plasticity and presumably behavioral changes. I think that what we're, the, the, the goal is to get to the point where we can design highly monitored interventions um, with drugs that are pow have very powerful effects that we can select rationally pair that with neural stimulation and really make some headway into treating intractable uh, neuropsychiatric disease. So that's, that's what I really mean by single shot therapeutics and what our aim is and how we hope to apply what we learn about MDMA to broader uh, categories of disease. So I wanna share with you a little bit of work that I've done in Rob Blanca's lab to actually get at the mechanism of how is it that MDMA produces its therapeutic effect. So as uh, some of you know, you can't really do this kind of work in humans, uh, although Dr. Volenleiter might disagree. He's done a lot of mechanistic work uh, in volunteers. But in order to really get genetic access and to do the kind of synaptic and circuit uh, interventions that we want to show causation for the changes that we're looking for, we really need to work in mice. And mice are, you know, uh, they, they're social animals, and uh, these are some pictures I took of my mice just running around. And, uh, you know, you may wonder why I'm so obsessed with mice, and my family asked that as well. But, uh, you know, they, this, is a great, um, this is a great way to get at some of those basic questions. So that's really, that's why we're relying on this kind of, uh, this, this model to study a human effect. So to quote myself, because I can, and Rob... Uh, <laughs> Uh, this work builds on an enormous amount of other people's work, so I don't, <laughs> I don't want to take away from that at all, but this is uh, something that we published in Cell last July that um, got a fair amount of uh, response, which I was very happy to see, and our goal is to raise awareness that MDMA is a potential probe into social behavior that has become a huge, of huge interest to the neuroscience community at large. And the question is, so what is the therapeutic mechanism? And of course, doctors uh, Midhofer, Grobe, Danforth will have more to say about this, but 
it's not so much an extinction of fear phenomena and post-traumatic stress. What we're positing is that it's actually by strengthening the bond between patient and therapist, you're catalyzing a long-term change. And it's that the relationship is the therapy. That's what psychiatrists have told me and what I think is fundamentally true. Um, and that's, so that, if that's the mechanism, then that's what we have to understand. How is it that MDMA can produce changes in social behavior and what's the basis of those changes and can we use that information uh, to lead to other forms of therapy? And so that's, that's really what we're trying to model in mice. So this is the paradigm that we're using. It's basically a social preference assay. So you see here is you have two, uh, two mice. These are uh, young adult uh, male mice. We've done it in females as well. Uh, and this is a three-chamber setup where you have one mouse that's under a cup and another cup that's empty. And so then you have this free mouse that is, sits in the middle. And then after you raise the barriers, he wanders around. And what we basically we quantify is which side does he prefer? Does he prefer to be on the side with the mouse under the cup, or does he just want to explore the novel object of a cup, irrespective of whether there's a mouse in it? And we have a way to quantify that. So this is one of several assays we use, but we'll stick with this for uh, the, the interest of time. And what we found is that you know this has been a major roadblock in the literature. It's very, been very difficult to demonstrate social effects of MDMA in mice. So this assay and you know, looking over this time course, we see something very interesting. So this is the sociability index. This is more social as you go up and less social as you go down. And this is uh, minutes uh, of exploration of that three chamber apparatus um, after MDMA uh, injection. What we see here is this is, a, again, some quantification of this graph, but you see a dose dependent effect on social, social preference in mice. So this took a, a lot of effort, uh, but a couple interesting things is you see that this is a slowly evolving process that takes you know, minutes. So this is, you know, there's social anxiety involved in overcoming you know, these basic uh, you know, fear in mice and you know, likely in humans as well. But we see something that looks a lot like what we see in, uh, in humans. And that's a major first step towards mechanistic understanding. So what about the mechanism? So this is a picture that a friend of mine drew for me. And this is CERT is the mechanism. And I am going to skip over a large amount of unpublished work, uh, again, which I'm happy to talk about later. Um, but, but my friend Kat, so this is, these are synaptic vesicles. And this is kind of like a, you know, the Grimm brothers. But you have uh, these, these foxes, which are the uh, MDMA molecules. And they're basically forcing reverse transport of serotonin molecules out of the, out of the vesicle. So that's the mechanism that we're, that we're looking at. And CERT seems to be a major target. And again, skipping over a fair amount of work, we've been able to confirm that in, um, in, in our animal models, that we have the same kinds of uh, receptor requirements as we see in humans. So, a little bit more about the kinds of things that we're looking for. And this is just a taste of the, the level of analysis that we're able to bring to this question of social behavior in, uh, of, of MDMA when we're using mouse models. So this is, again, this is, this is a, a tool that I'll just briefly explain, but this is a genetically modified mouse where dopaminergic neurons uh, are especially tagged. And we're able to put this, basically an act a calcium dye, this is an activity indicator called GCAMP, into these neurons through viral mediated gene expression. And we put a fiber optic, basically just a, a piece of fiber here, and we're able to visualize activity in dopamine neurons um, in, in vivo awake behaving mice during social activity. And this is really, this is a technique that's only been available in the last uh, few years. But what you can see here is that, you know, what we see is actually an enhancement with MDMA of this uh, of the dopaminergic neuron activity. And we have further evidence, again, which uh, I would be happy to share later, that this involves an interaction between serotonin neurons from the dorsal RAF8 innervating the ventral tegmental area, which is this area that has all these dopamine neurons. So beyond that then, okay, so now we have a couple brain areas. We have serotonin uh, release into the uh, ventral tegmental area, and uh, now we're able to actually look at what are the synaptic events. So this gets at um, the question that I started earlier, that what, is the, what are the plasticity, what are the forms of plasticity at synaptic levels that might lead to these uh, pro-social changes uh, in mice? And what you can see here is, so this is, again, we're recording from the ventral tegmental area in brain slices, 
And we're looking at both excitatory and inhibitory inputs, since that's really what comprises the microcircuit um, within this part of the brain. And we're able, through uh, various means, to label only those neurons that project to the nucleus accumbens, which is a major area involved in social behavior. Uh, and we're able to record specifically from dopamine neurons. And what you can see here is that a single uh, short uh, application of MDMA produces a form of long-term depression in both excitatory and inhibitory uh, inputs. And this is something that we're actively investigating is what's the mechanism? What's the net effect on excitability in this microcircuit, in this uh, small neural network? And with that information, we can go and establish causation um, with, the, with the whole animal behavior. Now we've taken this a step further as uh, you know, the uh, ventral tegmental area projects to uh, the nucleus accumbens and we see again something similar there, which you know, this is, uh, we're recording from neurons uh, in, the, in the accumbens and stimulating a prefrontal cortical afferents. And what you can see is again, MDMA seems to produce these long lasting changes. So I wanna just briefly demonstrate, you know, what is the possible application to to deep brain stimulation. So as I mentioned before, uh, deep brain stimulation is uh, pretty crude. You put, this is uh, from Wired Magazine, but you put, a, you, you put an electrode into a part of the brain, the subthalamic nucleus, and uh, you turn it on at 100 hertz and you leave it on. So if you know, we think that electrical uh, you know, bursts of stimulation can trigger long-term plasticity, why do we need battery packs? This really does not make sense and goes against, you know, again, four decades of, uh, of research into this topic. And so again, I return to this idea that we develop with MDMA and ketamine is that you need two things, not just activity, but cellular drug action. In the case of MDMA, we have the drug action, we provide the neural activity presumably through therapy, uh, and then that produces long-term plasticity. So again, the goal and what we're hoping to translate into clinical practice is how do you combine neural stimulation with, um, with rational drug design to get these kinds of effects. So again, I'm just gonna skip a, a little bit of this, but essentially we're able to look at uh, deep brain stimulation um, in mice uh, and show that we see something in brain slices very similar um, to what we see in, uh, in humans and in, in vivo. And again, that what we, we're able to look at the synaptic changes that are occurring as a direct result of this form of stimulation. So again, the, the, the broad uh, the picture that I wanna communicate to you is that we have uh, something that we learn from MDMA that we hope we can apply to uh, clinical interventions like deep brain stimulation. So just to sum up what I'm, trying to build up here is a, a case that single shot therapy is something that is possible and is something that we can apply the lessons from the recent advances uh, with MDMA and ketamine into something that has a, a, broad, uh, a broad impact in, in, in psych psychiatry and neurology. So we wanna identify patient uh, agents that have powerful lasting effects after single exposure. We use preclinical models for genetic access in order to get key neural circuits that are required. And then finally, you want to use that information to develop uh, clinical interventions. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to talk afterwards. Thank you.